Hello, my name's Ajay Rai, and you're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Today, it's a privilege for us to welcome back His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince of Burma. His Royal Highness was forced to live a life of exile here in England from the age of 13, and from 1968 to 1988, was compelled to live a humble life of anonymity whilst educating and preparing himself on the hope that one day he could return to full-time duties back in Burma. Your Royal Highness, it's an honour to have you back on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Well, the topic today is leadership and selflessness. And uh, you're in a unique position that many of us, even though we'll experience what it means to be a leader in some form or fashion, will never really understand what it means to be a leader of a nation. Now, what does it mean to you to be a leader? To be a leader, one must be selfless. By definition, a leader has responsibility to the people he leads. Otherwise, he is not a leader. If he does not consider that his primary duty is to serve his people, he is not a leader. So in serving his people, he needs to make sacrifices, and that is part of leadership. It is the most important part of being a genuine leader, is to make sacrifices. To give you an example, I personally admire Nelson Mandela immensely. My goodness, what sacrifice he made. He never did anything for his own personal gain. He sacrificed himself. Can you imagine 27 years imprisonment? And he came out a wonderful man, no bitterness, full of forgiveness, and he changed South Africa. And I admired him. So that is my kind of genuine leadership. And is that the kind of leadership that you see around you? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I would like more leaders of the world to be like Nelson Mandela, to have some spiritual dimension to leadership. But isn't, Lead it, isn't it the case that he's one of very few? In, in fact, oh, there are not many who could, let's say, classify themselves in the same bracket as not Nelson Mandela That's or as right. a Gandhi. Or as you're, a... you're absolutely right. And people like Gandhi, you know, like Mandela, they are totally selfless. They, they are there to serve the people. And that is what leadership is all about. So therefore, why is it so difficult for our leaders to be selfless? Because obviously it, there's only a few examples that we see in the world today and in, in fact in history. That is because they're not genuine leaders. They are possessed by other things because they're not really thinking of the well-being of the people they lead. They may come up with rhetorics, they may come up with the marketing ideas, but that is not leadership. They're just selling political goods. And leadership is not genuine leadership. In fact, you can have analyze, you can analyze leadership in different levels. You get leadership at the state level for the whole countries. In this, in this case, you are responsible to all the citizens of the country. You can also have a business leadership. A business leadership is also very important because we're not talking about the stakeholder theory. That means that a business has got many stakeholders. It's not just the shareholders. It's not just the employees. It's not just the management. It is also about the environment. It's always about the business has to take care of what it is doing to the environment because all the businesses have got a very important role to play with the sustainable development, with the carbon footprint, and the ecology and global warming. All these are very much in the hands of the business. So that is, of course, cannot be divorced from the national leadership either. There had to be good laws to actually enhance business at the same time to protect the environment. And then you have another level of leadership, which is at the community level, and you need leadership at all levels. So you need good community leaders who set good examples so that children can actually aspire to be like those leaders. Then we have a good society. Now what you were talking about just earlier, that's, that's uh, corporate social responsibility. Course, it's becoming yes. more and more of a, a fashion, so to speak, that yes. companies are going that way yes. and they want to be seen yes. to be going that way, yes. that they actually yes. care. Yes. Yes. Now, uh, do, do you see that just as a trend, a passing trend, or do you, do you think there's a genuine intention there? Well, they are coming to terms with the realities because people have become more educated, they're more aware of the uh, consequences of the decisions made by corporate leaders. But however, I do not think that all corporate leaders are sincere leaders in the truest sense because they are there basically to line their own pockets in many cases and that is where the problem is. And a lot of corporate leaders, they don't even care about what happens to the pensioners. 
and a lot of pension funds were raided. And can you imagine the people who work all their lives and hoping that they can have a peaceful, modest, you know, um, uh, retirement, and everything was taken away from them. My goodness, that is very sad. And so, now the state has to intervene somehow. Right. Yes. I mean, that's the that's a, the yeah. pension situation in this country yes. right now. Yes. Uh, however, what do you think about these big multinational companies, the the financial institutions or the the the, the oil companies? Yeah. Uh, do Do you think that again they are really genuinely taking on their the responsibility? either for the environment or for the genuine interest of, of the people that are their, as you said, their, their stakeholders or their... I doubt very much if they take into account the interest of all stakeholders. The problem is that uh, there is too much emphasis on the shareholders' wealth, crea creating wealth for the shareholders at the expense of the rest of the stakeholders, which is unfortunate. There has to be a balance. Of course, in a free market system, you do need investors to keep the industry going, but the disproportionate returns and also fat cat syndrome I'm not too happy about. Because a lot of executives are too overpaid. Why do they need so much money? What for? What for, really? You know, that means that they are really not leaders because they're too selfish and they want so much material gain, and they want to use the material gain, the money, as power. And that is negative. That is not at all positive. Now, you said earlier that businesses have a goal. Perhaps it is the primary goal, yes. like you said, to line their own pockets, to make profit. Yes. So can that really go hand in hand with the goal to be selfless or, or to, to think of the greater good ah, this and is to serve a, the greater good? This is an interesting question because... We will have to go back to the fundamental meaning of profit. And I don't think that in this interview we are discussing the profit in a philosophical sense. I'll be very brief about this. The real profit is happiness, harmony for the humanity. But if they're not achieving that, there's only money profit that is not real profit for society. And that is a one much higher level of analysis. And we can look at this at a separate issue. So because we're interested at the moment on leadership, and we, in the first part, we talk about power and moral authority. Now we're gonna link leadership to moral authority. Now, if a leader, whether it is a political leader or a business leader, if they adopt their responsibility in t then they will deserve moral authority and they will be on the right track. And there will be no raiding of the pension funds, there will be no degrading the environment. Whatever decision they make will be balanced and they will take into account the social benefits and the social cost and they have to correspond to each other. In other words, if you're causing a great deal of social cost for the benefit of a few, and that is not real profit for the society. That is a loss-making situation. So from a, from a, let's say, altruistic point of view, it yeah. is possible to do kind of well and, and also to do good. Oh, of course. I mean, in the Buddhist culture, in a lot of the real sort of, you know, traditional society, people do things without money as a medium of exchange. They give. They exchange goods and services without using money. My goodness, if you actually turn it into money, the real economy of this society will be 10 times the UN statistics. But it's not recorded. But that isn't that rich. You know, when you're ill, the doctor comes along, cure you without a fee, and you might want to give him a bunch of bananas, he is very happy. And that's perfect. Well, let's, let's look a little bit more at leadership. What yeah. would you define as the characteristics of good leadership? A good leadership, first, selfless. Secondly, intelligence. Thirdly, he has to be well trained for the occasion. He must be able to rise up to the occasion. It is no good if the person wants to serve. There are many, many people who like to serve, but they don't have the capabilities because they have not received the, the necessary skill or they don't have the high enough intellect to grasp the need or to assess the situation and to develop the skill and be prepared for it. In other words, good intentions are not enough. Oh, no, not at all, not enough. Good. I mean, you, you need the skills, you need the skills. You have very important human skills, and you should be able to judge people. You have to, because a leader also needs help. 
he needs a porter, he needs a servant, you know, to serve him because he cannot do everything himself. After all, leadership is not one man's mission. Leadership is a collective activity. Funny thing is, it is a collective that has to succeed. When a leader wants glory for himself, that is the beginning of the end of leadership. Now, when we put the two words together, leadership and selflessness, yes. it, it sounds like a very noble ideal. And, yes. and I think there are terms like servant leadership, which are banded around in business, yes. yeah. in business circles. Yeah. Now, do you think this is uh, like a, a trend in which uh, leaders of all kinds are realizing that just having the skill set or having, yes. let's say, the, the hard skills of, of is course, not enough. Yeah. And in fact, there are yeah. the soft skills necessary. Uh, naturally, yes. And, and yeah. what are those soft yeah. skills? Actually, the servant leadership is nothing new. In fact, there's a Chinese proverb. Now, if you want to be a leader, be a good follower. That's what it means, because what happens is you learn from the good leaders. Being a servant is not a degrading situation. A servant can be very honorable and very noble. In Christianity, you know, the washing of feet, what does it mean? Is it, it's like servant, but it's a very noble one, isn't it? But spirit behind it is very interesting. And leadership is actually also a spiritual revolution, because within oneself. And what happened is that the follower, the servant, is trying to emulate the leader by serving and learn from him one day the servant is going to be the leader. In business situation, what has happened is that a lot of people have become very selfish. I don't know if you're familiar with theory X and Y, McGregor's theory X and Y no, in explain. management. There are two views of human nature, and they're not mutually exclusive. In some situation, theory Y is selfless, altruistic, and cooperative, and for the good of the, the others, and so on. But theory X is very much like selfish, lazy, you won't work unless you have the reward. But these are the extreme position. But actually, it is a mixture at any given time. There are times when people can be very selfish, but a true leader should always be selfless at all times. But in other words, you know, he should care, because otherwise he actually uh, abdicate his position as a leader the moment he becomes selfish. So the leader must be selfless. But what is it? I mean, often we can start out with yeah. good intentions, at yeah. least on some level, yeah. and then on the on the path of leadership, it, yeah. it seems that the higher we maybe go, yeah. the more difficult it gets. Yeah. And then um, getting oh, that's into quite interesting. Yes. Yeah. That is what happened is that people start with good intention, and the environment took over. What has happened? The good intentions are not working, so he resort to more or less use of force or use of power. The paradox is the more the people who use power in a power failure situation. That's why you can see that when someone lost authority, what does he do? He resort to power. Now power in the sort of revolutionary situation is that comes out of the barrel of the gun. So because you cannot persuade people, people are not cooperating. So in that situation, the bosses or the leaders tend to become dictatorial, and that itself is a failure. If you have to resort to dictatorial measure, that means that you have failed as a good leader. But in the short term, there are extreme situations. You are a leader, you have to use almost like the dictatorial method, but your intention is still good. You want to abandon these as soon as possible. So what you do is you keep the peace. And after that, you've got to talk to people, look, I have to do this measure for your good, not because I enjoy it. Look, i like you to be responsible. Look, I want to give you back all your freedoms. Can we do that? That is a process of negotiation with the masses, with the people, the people who are being led, the people who are being ruled. That dialogue has to be there. And in political leadership, there must always be feedback. Now here, funny thing is, Monarchy can play a very important role as a sounding board. Let's say the executive government is not doing a good job. The people should have access to the monarch to say, Your Majesty, we are unhappy. The government is not doing a good job. And the king can say, Minister, I need to summon you for a conference. 
this is what I hear from my people. Can you do something about it? And that has got the we go back to the circle of responsibility. Okay, now th there are two things I'd like to pick up on here. Yes. First of all, it's the role of the the the, the monarch, the yes. king, as yes. a leader, and how yeah. you see that particular role. The the other point is, uh, I think often the role of a leader is quite lonely, and I Literally. wanted to ask. Yes. Your own experience yes. in the position as a crown prince, yes. how you've experienced that, and also how have you dealt with it? So perhaps the first question, yep. but what are the qualities of a, a monarch in terms of leadership? Oh, a monarch has to be a philosopher. He should be fully aware of human nature with the positive aspects and negative aspects, the um, shortcomings, human fallibility. The monarch has to be aware himself that he can be fallible. Therefore, he should also learn to listen to the wise men and the advisors because he cannot know everything. But spiritually, he is enlightened. But on the technical issues, there are certain aspects he needs advice from his advisor. But then that council, the royal council or the privy council, I would call it, can actually guide the executive government. So that is very important. But not force upon them, convince them. Convince them, look, you know, this is the way forward. We do have problems. Problem needs solving. Life is full of problems. You solve one problem, another problem will appear. But that is a challenge. That itself makes life worth living because, you know, you are not a vegetable. You're always sort of solving problems. It is also enjoyable if you can do it the right way. So there's nothing wrong with that. Now, as for the loneliness, life at the top, it is there. And of course, then you have to train yourself, you have to learn to enjoy your own company, solitude can be quite good. You can reflect on life, you can think about life, and it's not necessarily bad. I think in the modern Western society, people are very stressed when they are put in solitude. They should not feel that way. Solitude is the time you can reflect on your own life, a matter of life and death, life after death, relationships, it is a wonderful opportunity. It is not negative. But it does not mean that you are isolated from others because you are still in touch with others on a day-to-day -day basis. But occasionally you need a retreat. And that is why you have the Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, whatever, you have the meditation centers, you have the retreat centers, whatever. And that is the meaning of it. Well, let's, let's actually look at that, because yeah. your own faith tradition being yeah. Buddhist, yes. how have Buddhist values uh, guided you as a leader? Oh, immensely, because being brought up as a Buddhist boy, classical, traditional Buddhist boy, it gives me a great deal of strength, because the thing I have to learn as a Buddhist boy is that, you know, I'm very, I'm very lucky to have wonderful parents who love me. I always know my parents love me. I have never doubt. That gives me a lot of comfort, a lot of strength. Even though I wasn't able to see them, they were not able to see me, I know in their hearts they love me, they adore me, and I adore my parents. So wherever I am, it is always with me, all my life. And also, the thing is that when I was a boy, sometimes I'm unhappy, my mother say, my son, look at the moon. You know, tonight, it's almost pitch black. In a fortnight's time, it will be full moon. Life is always up and down, but don't let it upset you. It will pass. In Buddhism, the essence of Buddhism is that nothing is permanent. And you live with that idea. You don't take things so sort of serious when things go wrong. When things, are, when things go so right and wonderful, you don't get conceited. You don't become big-headed. It will pass. You enjoy it, share it with everyone. When you are sad, you are lonely, it will, it will pass. You learn to live with that, and you could meditate, and there are ways and means of dealing with that. You don't have to become depressed. Of course, life has got little modulation up and down. If it is not there, like constant, you're in paradise. But we're not in paradise, we're living on earth. So you will have that up and down. What you don't want is all these peaks and troughs by sharp edges up and down that creates mental instability and it could affect your psyche and that's not good for the society. If you have people like that, a society full of people who are with the mood swing up and down, left to right all the time, 
what kind of society you're going to have. It won't be very happy. It won't be very harmonious. Now, I know that in, in Buddhism, there's a very particular understanding of the yes. nature of the divine. Yes. However, I would still like to ask you, what yes. is the nature of God? Well, the nature of God is very interesting because the Buddhists do not recognize a God as a personal creator. Buddhists accept that there is something above us, beyond us, superior to us, that itself is like we call it nature. But then that is a question of interpreting what God is. To the Christian, God is so clear, so powerful. God is forever. God created. Everything is created by God. And the Buddhists say, well, who created God? And we're going into a circular debate about God. In the end, like a circle, what goes in the opposite direction could meet. But in the end, we all agree God is something above us, beyond us. And we cannot fight God, we have to obey God in the sense that we go along with what God or what nature dictates. And do you, you, do you yourself yes. feel accountable to a divine force, a divine nature, a divine being? I wouldn't say that we Buddhists are accountable of some external power, but we can say that we live with that condition as a constraint. In other words, we have to live according to what the nature ordains us. So it's basically nature ordination in which the other religions, they would say that it is a divine ordination. We call it nature ordination. So let's, let's go back to leadership. Now, yeah. uh, one of the aspects of leadership these days is uh, personal growth, the personal growth of your team or, of in course. your case, of yeah. your people. Yeah. Now, how would you go about yeah. achieving that or facilitating that? Yes, you've got to be lucky. I think a lot of people miss out in life because they're not lucky enough. And the people have to be taught that human beings have to evolve, develop as an individual because you could start as a child totally ignorant of the world, but step by step, if you're lucky enough, your good parents will bring you up in such a way that you are a, a good citizen, and you are educated, you have developed a thirst for knowledge, which is very important. You like education, you like to learn, you love friendship, you like to do sports for physical you know, well-being. So everything is a balanced life. And you have to grow emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. And that is very important. All human beings should be given a chance to develop in these three core areas. And, uh, well, in, in the case of your role as, yes. uh, as a crown prince, yes. and hopefully one day as king, yes. how do you understand your role? What would you relate it to in terms of, it's, it's not just a, a kind of, you kind of compare it to, like, saying being a leader of a company. Quite, how, yeah. how, how would you, or in what way would you compare being in that position to any other role that you can think of? Yeah, my role is to relate to people. Um, I relate to my people, my duties. I relate to my duties. Duty comes first, and my duties to my people. Not only that, I also like to relate to the the world at large, the global village, like your movement, the peace initiatives. So I'm involved in it because ultimately we live on the same planet. So we're all citizens of the world. If we think this way. I think we can get rid of a lot of selfishness. Then we'll think about the poor who are suffering. And the rich can say, okay, you know, let's have, let us give you something. We can feed you. Now, if we take this approach, the political leaders of the rich nations, if only they take that approach, I think there'll be peace in the world. There'll be less extremism. There'll be less violence. Because I think the consequences of ignoring the poor is quite dire. Nowadays, it seems like uh, the the role of kings and queens in our yeah. society are often yeah. just as titles. They're, yes. they're figureheads and, of course, even sometimes just looked at as a kind of commodity in, yes. which attracts tourism, yes. I mean, yeah. in the case of our country yeah. here. Yes. Yeah. Now, obviously, that's not all true. There, there is a role, there is a function well, that goes absolutely. beyond yes. just this kind of uh, yes. external yeah. sense. Yes, yeah. Have you ever thought of your role uh, being similar to that of a parent, where perhaps a king and a queen are not just these figureheads, but are taking on a kind of parental role for the nation? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's how it has been throughout centuries. You know, the, the king and the queen, they are basically the parents. So you have 
the parental love for the subjects, I mean, in the modern time we can call them citizens, doesn't make any difference. Still they have the responsibility, they have to take care of, they have to give them love, they have to give opportunity for them to grow and to give them harmony and peace. And also, in the process, you have to make good and humane laws so that the people can prosper and they can achieve happiness. May I ask, in your opinion, which royal families or monarchies have been successful in being effective in that role as parents of the nation? I believe the Thai king fulfilled that role very well. And he's the most revered king, I believe, in the whole world. And the Thai people absolutely adore their king. And this is quite sad for the Burmese refugees in Thailand. Until they came to Thailand, they did not realize how important monarchy was. Now, when they go to Thailand, they got to know how important monarchy is, how good the king is to the Thai people. I have letters from the Burmese refugees. Why are you not home with us? Very sad letters. You know, why isn't our king with us? And I have to explain to them, because of the circumstances, we have to be patient, we have to wait. When the time comes, at the right moment, I will come. That's my reply. So mm -hmm. it is very important. I think Thai monarchy is very good. I believe there must be other monarchy as well. In this country, how much of the queen is very good too. I mean, the queen mother, the late queen mother, was also very good. She was a really, you know, grandmother figure. And people adored her. Your Royal Highness, often we see that the path of leadership is not only a lonely one, but can be a very treacherous one. And uh, often on that path, it's, uh, it's easy to fall away and to, to kind of go away from the principles and the values sure. that actually yeah. we wanted to yeah. uphold and in fact be an example yeah. of. And, and that's my question to yeah. you. Yeah. Why is it so difficult to be a good example? Well, I think the, a lot of leaders, they don't have the internal strength to actually to follow the path, you know, to stay on the path, to stay on course. And of course, one is buffeted by winds of change, a lot of forces, pressures, vested interest, and you really have to detach yourself. You've got to see, oh, that person is asking me to do this and that. For what reason? Is it for the good of all or is it for his own good? Is he using me? Then you've got to be quite straight, you know. Sorry, I am here as a leader to serve all, not just a few. So, in other words, the leader has to be very strong within himself. It's about internal strength. It's not just a physical force, brute force, it's about moral strength. And is that something given or is that something that we can attain? Oh, that you can attain, you can develop that. You can develop consciously, you can discipline yourself to have that. But how do you actually go about achieving it? I mean, let's say I'm, I've just suddenly been given a responsibility, I feel out of my depth, yeah. and yet I want to succeed, I want to make it a success. Uh, and to fulfill the, the dreams and ambitions that, that, that go with it, how can I do it? Discipline yourself not to waver from your dreams and your ideas of serving people, your value system. Don't lose it. Stay on it. Never lose it. So if you, say, if you believe in integrity, be in, keep it. Don't compromise. Don't sell your soul to the devil. Just keep it. Be strong. And if by any reason I, I somehow find myself going off track and yeah. I, I, I realize maybe I've yeah, perhaps you, sold out and my people are suffering, yeah. how do I get myself back on track? Uh, you've got to pull your back in because you have to pull the rain in. You've got to, because here it's interesting in the Buddhism, there are two people in you, you know, you and you. But sometimes you say to your mind, God, I could kick myself because there are two people in yourself. So don't let it be two people, be one consistent one person. Your Royal Highness, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. I thank you. It is my pleasure too. Thank you very much. You've been watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. If you'd like to see more of our shows, we're on the web at www.definingmoment.eu. Thank you for watching and we wish you all the best.